And then it is my honor to introduce today's presenter. Uh, Omatulani Kahindi Osems is an experienced data scientist with a master's degree in data science and a very strong commitment to promoting inclusivity in the tech industry. She's got a wealth of experience in data analysis and visualization and has been at the forefront of leveraging data for informed decision making. Omatulani is an avid writer, regular publishing insightful analytical articles on Medium. Uh, where she shares her expertise with a global audience. Welcome. Thank you so much, Lazy, for that. And welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever, you know, I think we're on like different time zones. And um, yeah, I'll be speaking on, you know, um, no code data visualization today. And I hope we're all able to get something out of it, you know, throughout the session. So, um, I would share my screen, right? And just, you know, get into it. Um, Lazy, can you please confirm that we can all see my screen? Yep, great, thank you. Um, so guys, we'll be looking at um no code data visualization with Power BI. This is one of you know the many sessions we would hold on, you know, no code data visualization and Probably for the other ones, we'd look at other tools like Tableau, um, Luca, and the likes. So um, we'd go through the you know, history of like the rise of no-code data visualization, what it means, um, the benefits of no-code data visualization, some key tools in the industry. We'll probably just mention a few because there are like numerous ones out there. We'll um, look at the, an overview of Power BI and have a live demo session, yeah, which I'm excited about, um, using a Spotify data set and Yep, we we'll just look at some key takeaways and some, you know, technical tips of how to, you know, go about working with Power BI if it is your first time or if you, you know, if you want to actually advance your skills working with Power BI. And we'll take some questions at the end of the session. You can either, you know, put your questions in the chat session or I'm pretty sure we'll have, you know, a chance to ask one or two questions also at the end of the session. So first, um, for data visualization, it's, you know, a means of, representing data graphically, you know, making it easy to understand, analyze and draw insights. So currently in the world, we have, you know, the amount of data we have, you know, being, um, being produced is kind of multiplying every single period. So we have to think of ways to actually, innovative ways to actually display this data, innovative ways to actually visualize this information also. And that's, you know, where data visualization comes in. It kind of, it's the bridge between, you know, raw data and actionable insights because you know we just can't there isn't much you can get out of data which are actually like you know putting it away that makes in a way that makes sense to um probably your management stakeholders or people that need that information to make you know insightful decisions in various industries ranging from you know the government um government industry uh, government related industries policies and you know product driven spaces also um, in recent years also, we've seen like um, a tremendous growth in the data visualization space from, you know, we've gone from using um, Excel to, to visualize your data to using um, various, you know, visualization tools. And we've also moved further to, you know, working with interactive dashboards also, not just statics, static ways of visualizing your data. So they've been like really great growth in that area. And we've also seen, you know, um, data pipelines being built where, you know, data is automatically, um, um, there is like there are, you know, basic sort of automations done where you don't necessarily have to, you know, go into your dashboards every moment to actually, you know, probably display information for a new month or for a new period. So there, there has been a lot of automation done in that space also. Um, Data visualization is not only it's it not only helps to simplify complex data. It also helps you know businesses and individuals to you know make better decisions. And to be fair, it's not just about you know businesses and product driven spaces or you know places that have big data. In my day to day life, too, I also use you know some sort of charts for my budgets and um so like for some personal things. So it's very helpful for like you know personal use also if you are the type that tries to measure how much you spend in a month. So that's very helpful. Um, so yeah, we'll look at the visual um, the evolution of data visualization. Data has been a powerful decision making tool in like for centuries because every single thing we do in the world like involves data. Every single thing from sending a text message to 
you know, using your card to buy something online or every single thing we do, even to speaking at events, it involves data. So um, there is no way, you know, data is a, it's basically a very important decision making tool because, um, you know, from sales, from like, you know, having interactions online, people can help make more, can help build more personalized service from, you know, those sort of interaction. And I believe that so far data has helped kind of, um, fine tune products, create more personalized services and helped us actually grow as, you know, as a community and also basically in the whole world in like various sectors. And um, like I said earlier, visualizations have gone from, you know, static chats, just having, you know, chats you can interact with necessarily to um, having very interactive chats where you could, you know, use things like um, filters, slices to pull out um, specific information about what you are interested in. And, and also, um, no code data visualization also enables. Before we go into no code data visualization, there is a small graph here, um, a small you know diagram here that looks at how data has you know, you know data visualization has changed over the years. Right, we've gone from using spreadsheets. To be fair, I'm not sure what existed before Excel, but I'm sure there was something that existed before Excel. So we've gone from that to using Excel, and in Excel also you could you know plot various um. There's some basic um graphs available in Excel, like bar charts, um, pie charts and the likes, but definitely those are not very interactive. So we've gone from that to using various organizational dashboards and Power BI comes in here because we, um, you know, with tools that enable, um, when I say cloud tools, right, that enable you to connect to, you know, the data sources that are online, that's where, you know, the concept of data math comes in because, um, in the current world of now, most of you know, um, most of the the most of the industries that use data have their information stored online, probably coming from a website or coming from their mobile app or you know, coming from the various solutions they've built to provide um services to people. So this data is definitely stored online, and it's easier to connect your data stored online to you know another cloud to basically. So that's where the concept of like you know organizational dashboard comes in. It's kind of you know. It's um it's kind of works with it helps us create a proper pipeline from collection of data from whatever you know website or wherever it's coming from down to you know um some sort of tools you use to clean that data and down to your visualization too and yeah the for the big data ecosystem too this is um something that are more related that is more related to companies that have very very large data sets for well, like as much as we say you know every organization use data. Every organization has data. They are like levels is not probably it's probably not the right word, but there are levels to the data set we're talking about. For you wouldn't compare the kind of data um Instagram has to the kind of data probably a startup has, right? So um in terms of you know big data ecosystem, we're looking at you know very large corporations that have to actually have proper technologies, proper techniques in place to work with their data set. So um, that's where, you know, the concept of big data ecosystem comes in. There is typically a data lake. Um, first there is data, it comes in through an ingestion engine, then there is a data lake. And in this situation, um, for a data lake, it basically stores every single information about, you know, every single data coming from whatever source, for like let's use Instagram, for example, it stores information about, um, let's say posts, likes, and down to the marketing area of Instagram, right? There is the part of Instagram that enables social interaction. There is a part that is also made for marketing and sales. So, you know, the data lake typically is a space where you could store all of that in one place. Then there would now you can now create probably, you know, specific, you know, specific um, pipelines to analyze data based on your, you know, based on what you are trying to find out at that period, specific pipelines to analyze data related to social interaction, data related to how much um, Instagram is probably making from, you know, their marketing services set up. So um, the concept of big data ecosystem is more useful to companies that have actual, you know, that kind of um, produce very large amount of data sets. So yeah, this is just explaining to us how, you know, the concept of like, data and data visualization has, you know, um, um, grown over the last few years. And yep, back to no-code data visualization, right? Um, no-code data visualization, it's the one thing that like I love about it is that it's, you necessarily do not have to, you know, you necessarily do not even know how, you don't need to know how to write a single line of code. 
you just need to you know import your data as long as you know what you are trying to find out you know you just need to you know come with your right questions or come with the questions you need to ask the data and import your data and do some basic drag and drops although it can get more complicated than that along the line but yeah it's it's easy it's 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 a, it's a very it's a space that's easy for you know people to just you know get into and you know learn along the line because obviously if you spend you know a couple of months actually using the drag and drop feature you would want to know more you would want to see what more you can get out of it but the main thing is that it's um it's a space that embraces um non-technical users basically it's easy for you to like it's easy for everyone even technical users to actually slowly get into you know the concept of data analysis and data visualization it's user friendly yeah accessible to a broader um, audience um you don't necessarily need to be a, a data expert as a domain expert in your field your field could probably be um as a policy maker as a domain expert in your field you could easily you know answer the kind of questions you want to without having to reach out to um, some sort of technical user to help you, you know, bridge that gap between your knowledge and the skills you need for that. And some of the benefits of, you know, this, um, of data visualization, no-code data visualization, it's the reduced learning curve, definitely. Um, you just need to understand. And the good thing is that they are built in a very user-friendly manner where you, you know, would look at the dashboard, you see the dashboard, they are, you know, key things that, you know, tell you what to do, that tells you how to go about importing your data, that shows you the various type of charts you can use. So they are, you know, very user-friendly. So basically it helps us with that reduced learning curve. I don't know if you've ever seen a, um, a programming dashboard. I wouldn't say they are like the most friendly thing to get started with. So with GitHub, you probably have to take a course on actually learning how to use GitHub first of all. So um, for data visualization tools, they are quite different, very, very different. It's easy for you to get started. You get faster insights. You could easily get a dashboard up and running. Well, let's not say a dashboard. You could get um some charts up and running in a couple of minutes, basically. You could answer the questions you need in a couple of minutes. And yeah, it's, you know, it answers your question without... It makes it easy for you to also make changes also in a couple of minutes. You do not have to go through some sort of um processes or you know some sort of steps to actually make changes. You using the like using the drag and drop features, you could easily, you know, what if I remove this data point and put um another column instead? What is this going to give me? So it's interesting actually to see that it allows you. It gives space for that curiosity, right? It gives space for you to actually learn and, you know, kind of make changes along the way. So that's, you know, another interesting thing about it. We'll look at some more benefits. And yeah, um, accessibility is one of the major benefits. It breaks down barrier, like we've always said, regardless of your background, regardless of your, you know, technical background, regardless of your domain background, you can easily engage with data that you have. You could easily, you know, work with data that you have. You do not need any coding skills necessarily. You just need to, you know, know how to work around the platform. Also, it um, enables speed and efficiency. Um, you could easily connect to your data source, import. The interesting thing about these tools also, they allow, you know, for basic data cleaning, data transformation, you could, you know, transform your data from probably um, a text um, data type to a numeric data type. It allows you to, you know, transform or like clean your data sets in the same um, interface also. It enables rapid insights. Let's say you have, I mean, the world is moving very fast. Typically things change in it like in a minute and you let, I, I'm not very sure of the scenario to use, but let's say you, you really want to get um, an insight out of something immediately and, you know, you don't necessarily need to reach out to anyone to do this. You can, you know, just jump on your system, pull out the thing you need to, um, you, you know, pull out the, the sort of insight you need to pull out and probably make decisions right at that spot. So that's one of the interesting thing about it. It's, you know, it enables speed and efficiency, which is kind of necessary in, you know, decision making in some industries in today's space. Um, the reduced learning curve also, you know, teams can be proficient without, you know, extensive training, which kind of increases productivity. Um, you know, spending hours and hours in training session is not the best thing so far, to be fair. So you don't have to spend so much. You learn by doing, like literally you learn by actually using it, not necessarily sitting down for like a course and all of that. So, and um, another interesting thing is the collaboration feature part of it. You could share your 
dashboard or you could share your you know your interface with a team member a friend or whoever you know you're working with at that period you could make changes together and you know you could you could collaborate on you know things together at the same time so which is interesting it enables collaboration between um regardless of you know technical and net, net, net non-technical team members and you know the same way we have we could easily you know give sort of edit rights or some sort of you know rights with um our our tools like um, Google Doc and the likes, it's also possible using these visualization tools also. Um, and at the end of the day, if you have a dashboard good and ready and running, you could easily, you know, share it to the, you know, your whole team to see, you know, to actually use that dashboard to pull out insights also. So enables collaboration, collaboration on a very large scale and iteration also and ad adaptability. Um, like I said earlier, I think I was mentioning about how you could easily change a column to see some sort of other results. So that's been, it allows you to make changes as, you know, as fast as you want to be fair, you know, in an instance, basically. So you can easily modify your dashboard. You can, you know, adapt to changes as your business requirements come like, you know, for, um, for some of my experiences, right. I've had situations where you've built a dashboard, you have had, you know, you know, these are the metrics the organization is focusing at that focusing on at that period, let's say, you know, looking at product acquisition, then management could come to you um, in one instance and tell you, you know what, um, currently we're not, we don't want to look at acquisition again at this period. It's kind of more important for the business to look at, um, let's say, um, income, um, let's say revenue or some sort of subscription related things, right? So this is very much, you know, you could easily switch up your data, your dashboards with you know these visualization tools you could make changes to adapt to to your you know your business requirements and business requirements change every single time so um these dashboards and these tools are built in a way that they could easily adapt to those changes and you could also make changes to your data sources um it's cost efficient and in, in terms of cost efficiency you can look at it in two different ways um your team would not necessarily need to acquire um, you know bring um some sort of it you know skilled developers on board to use these tools it's something that could be learned like that you could learn as a team member also and it's cost efficient in a way that um those tools are sort of affordable right depending on you know yeah depending on you know how the one you decide to use and all of that so basically you have to do some sort of market research and look at the one that fits your your, your organization budget at that period and all of that so it's um most of these are affordable to use you know at a subscription based level or like a license level so those these are just some of the benefits i'm sure I dig deep there are other benefits also in this so um some tools are you know kind of dominant in the industry is tableau Power BI and currently Luca, um, Luca Studio. So I think it's called Data Studio now. Um, so for basically they still do the same thing, right? But one thing I would like to state here that there are so many tools to do different things in the industry, apart from like data related tools. Whatever tax you want to achieve, you would probably see up to like maybe at least 10 different solutions that would offer that, you know, that that goal for you but one thing that is important is to you know look at the kind of data you are working with look at where your data is being stored get some basic requirements or like some basic details about what you are trying to find out and use those you know use those um requirements to kind of drive the tool you are going to pick because there are so many tools but you have to look for the one that best that like kind of best fits what you are trying to achieve right and not get caught up in the whole you know um, there's a new tool out there. There's this other new tool out there. So it could be the you know the tool that was released in the last three years that kind of fits what you are trying to achieve the most. So it's kind of very important to you think of like, um, what am I trying to achieve? What does each of these two offer? You know, to get me where I want. For example, I would say Power. I would start with Power BI. For example, um, in a scenario where I would say it's better to use Power BI is if you have your your you know your data stored in um Azure, which is the Microsoft platform. So Power BI makes it easy for you to integrate with Microsoft's um, products, right? So um those are some sort of things that, that would be worth looking at. Let's say I have my data stored um on Azure or like a Microsoft uh, um, platform, it might be more reasonable to use Power BI because it allows you know easy integration between the various data sources, right? Um so those are some things that are kind of worth looking at. Um if you have your data stored on um, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, 
right? Um, it might be worth integrating with that kind of solution. But also you could say, um, I want to do more, um, I want to be able to, you know, explore various visualizations, which I'm not very sure Luca is best for. So basically you just have to think of your requirements and think of what each of these tools offer before, you know, and also look at your, your budget. Also, those are things you look at before picking um, some of these tools for whatever you want to do. So for example, Luca is not very great in terms of Luca is not, I would not say it's a beginner level tool. Um, it kind of requires a level of um, data knowledge and data, you know, data visualization understanding to use Luca. And it doesn't offer like, you know, the wild range of, um, the wild range of visualization tools, I would say Power BI and Tableau offers. So those are some things I would look at when I'm trying to pick a tool. But if I easily have my data probably stored in um, BigQuery or which is a look um a Google um platform. If I have my data stored in BigQuery on some sort of you know um GCP storage device, I'll probably want to go for Luca because of that ease of integrating with each of them. So these are some of the things you know that we're looking at, and also um another interesting thing why we added this chart is for us to see how organizations are adapting to using you know no code visualization to and also Power BI at a large. You can see um there's an increased adoption of you know the use of Power BI fifty eight percent. Organizations are not necessarily focusing on um more business or IT collaboration, which is important to be fair, but. We've been doing that so far, and I'm sure that has gotten to a solid amount or like a solid level. So organizations are looking to, over the last couple of years, people are looking to get more value out of their data. There is data everywhere. Data is like um, a lot of organizations have their data scattered in different places, have it in different platform. And there is so much insight, so much insight that lies in your data, so much insight, so much like ways you could, you know, figure out what your customers actually want or how to actually offer your services better. So organizations are looking at ways to actually get more out of their data and data visualization plays a huge role in that, a very huge role because, I mean, data is in raw format. No one would want to spend hours going through, you know, a, a list of, you know, JSON file or CSV file. So there's a large adoption of this kind of tools and basically Power BI also and, um, so yeah, it has the you know the highest level of adoption in terms of data analytics focus in you know as of twenty twenty two. I'm very sure these numbers would have changed for like twenty twenty three. Um, so we'd look at some key industries and use cases. Um, no code tools like they're making impact and significant impact in every single industry. And um, as a data scientist, one of the things I love so much about my work is it doesn't limit you. Right, you can apply your skill in any single field, any single field, ranging from healthcare to FinTech, to education, to the government space. And that applies to data code, um, no code visualization, visualization tools also. You can apply them in like any single industry because every single industry wants to get valuable insights from their data. Every single industry wants to make informed decision-making, right? So they are, you know, this is very, these industries are limited, but I would say there are some key industries because with fintech, there is a large amount of data that goes around in the fintech industry. And it's key for like the finance industry to actually um, make very informed decisions to, you know, drive more, create more personalized service, to manage, you know, portfolios for people, to, you know, manage, you know, to visualize market trends and all of that. So that's why some of these industries are picked. And for, you know, the retail industry also, you know, you need customer insights to know if, you know, what I'm actually selling is still what's actually selling or what I'm actually, you know, spending money on is what it. So th that's why we have some of these key industries picked also. So from the healthcare, ranging to marketing, to look at, you know, campaign performance, look at, you know, um the, the, the return, you know, with your campaign performance and all of that. So yeah, just a range of industries basically. And these are just some basic ones that, you know, I picked out that, you know, that are like very prominent with no code visualization tools. And for me personally, to be fair, I've used, you know, these tools to provide insights in the retail industry, in the marketing industry, in the healthcare industry, and also in the government industry. So literally almost five industries out of these spaces also. So, yep. Um, yeah, the exciting part would look at, um, <laughs> we'll have a short demo. I'll show you guys. Um, let me take this away.
So we would look at um we would have we have um a more like a template we want to work with, right? Which is something I've built out. So we'll have it like a short demo to actually rebuild that live here. And it will just give us a brief overview of what the data set looks like. Um, maybe I need to increase my screen a bit more for us to see. Um, so the data set we'll be looking at is I tried to pick a very interesting data set. I hope you guys find it interesting too. <laughs> it's um a Spotify data set. It you know has you know various information about you know songs and you know some basic attributes about the song like you know um the track name the artist name that produced this track um the release date of this song the spotify playlist and chats you know you know we have you know you could create various spotify playlists so we're, this data set has you know the number of time that particular song appeared in the spotify playlist the number of time you appeared in you know, spotify chat and also streaming statistics right um number of time it was streamed and it also like it, it didn't just this data set doesn't just focus on spotify it has um, details about the songs apple music appearance these are appearance and just these are other platforms that you know music platforms also and shazam chat also and there are also some features about this um audio like the um some features about the audio like the danceability rate like you know is this song suitable for dancing like um the liveliness um how lively is this song the energy level of the song and all of that and i picked this data because i find it to be fair i'm very interested in music i love music a lot so i was kind of drawn to this data set but also i think it's an interesting one because it would it's it's kind of it's basic right you could get our basic visualizations from this but you could also get you know very um very complex visualization from this also it's kind of like a very versatile you know um data set so we have some you know is it like very basic visualization we put out of this and we'll also look at i think one or two um complex visualization also from this and this is what we have this is the chat um we would be let me take the screen away Yep, yeah, this is the chat. Please let me know if it's not, you know, if we need to increase the screen or whatever. But this is the chat we have, and we will just be trying to, this is the dashboard we have, and I would be rebuilding it in an absolutely fresh page. So we'll just, you know, we'll go together and build this out together. And um, I've already imported the data set, which we can see here, but I would show us how to import this data set, right? This is just a fresh, Power BI dashboard with not turning it yet. So when you open Power BI, this is basically what you see, and you can go to you know get data. So like I said, they are like it's a very user friendly platform. You see things that point you to the right direction already. So if you go to get data, you know where is my data source coming from? Is it coming from a, a SQL um server, a text or CSV file? So basically, um we're working with a CSV file here because I downloaded this data set. Um, so you come here, you you know. The same way you look at where you have your data stored. I'll probably go to home and probably won't be importing this because I already have it imported. But yeah, you pick up your data set, open it, and it kind of loads every single thing the way we have it loaded here. And knowing that we are trying to replicate this dashboard, what I try to do first is personally, I I do this thing where I brand my dashboards to fit, you know. The organization or like to fit the organization colors and all of that so it kind of adds um it just you know gives it a sense of you know this is what i don't know how to phrase this but yeah just kind of brand it to fit you know whatever organization it is for and to do that there are some basics we don't have any chat here first we just go to this is you know where you pick your various visualizations chat um, tools from you know bar charts to line graphs and all of that but for now, we have a plain screen. We want to brand it to fit, you know, women who code. And as you can see, we have a, a green background going on. So we're going to pick that color. <laughs> so um, you come down to canvas color. You look at the range of colors you have here. Um, I pick green. And um you can make it as transparent as you want and you can make it obviously i don't think anyone would want to and to be fair you could want to have it like a very green dashboard or um 
I'm not the best. I just want to state that I'm not the best designer out there. So my design work wasn't, might not be really good. So I'll try to, I will make it very transparent. So because the focus, you need the focus to be on the chat you are building out, not on, you know, the background. So we'll, you know, make sure that this is very transparent kind of. Another thing you could do also is change the, the sizing, right, of your, your dash of your canvas. You could change the sizing of your canvas to custom. When you say custom, you know, you want to be able to expand the height as much as you want, expand the width of your, your canvas as much as you want. So because the, the more I increase this, you know, it kind of widens the space of this um, canvas, right? Um, for the height. And if I also increase the width, it also, you know, increases the, increases it horizontally basically. So those are some basic things you could do with this dashboard. There's so much more, so much more we definitely won't be able to cover today, but I would encourage that we pick this up and you know, um, just explore things, just play around it and all of that. You could use a background, um, a an image as your background. And I'm very sure there are scenarios where, like where that's very necessary for various industries. So you could use um, a wallpaper for that. So first of all, we have our data set and some of the questions we will be asking this data, looking at this dashboard is, first, we do like a basic analysis, looking at, you know, what are the total number of streams on this platform? What are the number of unique tracks on this platform? And how many artists are actually in this, you know, whole data set? Then we dive down to look at, you know, the top five artists with most songs on this platform. We have over, this data set has over, like um, as we can see, it has six hundred and forty-five artists, and but we would look at you know the top five artists with the most song, which um yeah of course Taylor Swift is part of them, so we would you know plot that out, and we would look at the top ten most streamed songs. Right, this is very useful in various scenarios. You could be um you know you know I think yes, yeah, Spotify does this thing where they invite more streamed artists right to have a talk at the end of the year and something like around that so this kind of this is how we click get out this kind of results so we'd look at that and would look at you know the distribution of song by the days of the month why i decided to add this is because um i don't know if anyone here has noticed um artists kind of release music around the first few days of the month right i don't know the whole hype about a new month new song so i've noticed that also so yeah, to prove that that hypothesis is true, I plotted out this chart. And we would also look at um evolution of songs released in Spotify over the last 10 years. To be fair, this shows Spotify's growth. Um, definitely this data set does not consist of all Spotify data, but looking at this, just this data set, it shows that um Spotify has grown because more artists have like actually released or like published songs on like their platform over the few last few years and would also do a correlation analysis because you know I mentioned we had some features about the songs like danceability and all of that liveliness so what we are trying to see here is does you know um the stream have some sort of direct correlation with danceability that means you know the people stream songs that are actually danceable to more than you know other kind of songs and also we look at you know the people stream songs that are like lively to listen to and we can see that that's definitely not real sometimes you need sad songs actually here so it's not very you know that's not it doesn't correlate in the right way and we also look at you know the energy level and all of that so let's get started with some um card visualization first of all we'll look at um i'll start with the total number of streams right and to use the total number of streams we had a column named stream here right um and what the chart i used for that was called it's called a card visualization a card um a card a card chart basically and like i mentioned before we use a drag and drop feature we drag it in here and basically honestly that's it it gives you the you know the total number of songs you know the total number of streams on this platform right and maybe we should start with the heading first. We'll get our head off. Um, to put, you know, some sort of heading, I'll use a text box here. Um, let's say Spotify analysis. Spotify analysis 2023. And we'll increase the, do some sort of basic font size change, font size changing and all of that. Yep. 
we might not be able to get that exact same, you know, the template we're working with because, yeah, probably spent more time working on that than what we'd have time for today. But yeah, this is what you can do. Let's say we have this name in here for it. Spotify analysis. Um, you can insert. Um, I think I have the woman who called. Um. Yep, I have our logo here, so I'll just insert that into this data set. I could put that here, and you could also edit this thing. You know this. Um, image inserted, you look at effects. So there's something called image here where you can style this image. There's also general here. And what I'm going to do is, you know, look at effects, right? I would um, do some shadowing here. And when I do that, you can see, I would, you know, go back to that to see how, so we see how it changes it. Currently you see that it changes it to, it kind of puts it out there more. it gives it some sort of shadow thingy. And I can, you know, reduce the size do a lot of more, you know, change the shadow color to green, something more similar to what we are using. There's so much more you can do. Give it a visual background. There's literally so much you can do. But giving it a visual background is not my thing, but so I'll change that. <laughs> um, we'll stop there and go to the actual visualization now. Right? And so, yeah, back to our visualization. We looked at, you know, we took out, we took out a card visualization. We took out the card visualization, put out the, you know, number of streams we have in this data set, right? And we could give this um card visualization a name because to be fair, you don't want to have, you don't necessarily want to have, you don't want to settle for whatever name Power BI gives your visualization. So I could either do that by renaming this here, renaming this visualization to streams. And or you could do that by um I think that would be here, giving your visualization a title, right? So you could use any of that to actually give this visualization a name. Or let's settle for you know whatever we have here since. So you just have to look for various visually appealing ways to actually present your information. So um we'll look at we'll stop there. And for the naming, we would give it um would make it bold for, for the category level, which is what we call, this is the category level. You can do some editing in the category level here. Make it bold, use the best, you know, sort of font size you want, change the color. So you just, you know, do things that makes your dashboard look more, you know, look, um yeah, look more matured, if that's the right word. So that's one of the visualization we've got in. I would, also, there's something we did in the previous one. I would give it a visual background and give it rounded edges. So all these things are just to make it aesthetically pleasing, which might not be necessary in some cases. Um, so that's that. The second thing we would try to get here is the number of tracks in this result. So for the number of tracks, we would just basically pull out back to our data set. It's also still a card visualization. Another thing you can do, right, if you know you would be working with the same sort of similar you know, visualization results, you can copy and paste that visualization. You know, we did some sort of editing here by, you know, giving it the bold font, giving it some sort of, some sort of shape. So to make sure you don't repeat that same thing, you can copy this visualization if you know you are trying to achieve the same thing. You paste it back here, gives you the same type of result. And what you do is that, you know, we are not trying to look at stream here again, but trying to look at number of track. So we would just, you know, take out this stream field, go back to the data set, and um, to look at number of track, we are looking at, you know, track names, right? We pull in, you know, the track names for this data set. And yeah, the interesting thing about this is that it could show you the actual data, right? Which is, you know, the tracks listed, and or you could tell your your data set, I want the count, not necessarily the actual data, and um. If we're saying we're looking at number of tracks, so we want the count in this situation. And you could also say you want the, you know, distinct count. There are situations where you would need, you know, distinct count in this situation, which means the unique time um, that information appeared in your data set. And there are some times where, you know, the unique time doesn't necessarily matter. You just want to see, you know, the total counts, right? So um, for this data set, we know a song cannot appear more than one time. 
So we will just look at you know the total count. And to be fair, we can verify this song appeared more than one time. Well, it did. So we we'll look at the distinct count actually. So we we'll look at just you know the actual number of tracks. Change the name also here again. So the major thing we did here is copy the same visualization, change the the data source, which is the column it's coming from, and change the name back to number of track. Then another thing we would do also, we are still working with a the same type of chat. We'd copy again, and I'm not very sure what we did next. Let's see. Yeah, the artists, the, you know, the different artists. We want to see how many artists we have in this data set. And the data set already gives us, I just removed the field. The data set already gives us the name of the artist. So we just drag and drop, change it back to unique count, and it gives us the unique artist we have in this data set. Rename it artist name. So that's how we get that. And something I would want to explore here, you know, we've always thought, we talked about how no code visualization tools are interactive in nature. And some of the things that make it interactive in nature is the use of filters, the use of slicers to pick, to kind of um, drill down your data to, to look at specific um, areas of the data set, right? And there is a feature in this data set that, that, that's called mode, right? It's just, you know, I think the mode of, um, the mood of the music in this situation. So you might have scenarios where I just want to focus on, you know, it could be a product data set where an organization sells digital product and print products, right? And you might be, you might just want to look at, you know, product performance for only print products, but you still want the same sort of metrics. So um, that's where you could use things like slicers and filter. So we would introduce a slicer here. And um, if you just you know click on these visualizations, you would see the name of the visualizations, like the name of the charts or the name of the tools. Um, so to introduce a slicer, um, this is what a slicer looks like. I would introduce a slicer here, and I want it. I want users to be able to you know look at this same this same sort of insight, but like you know using various using um, a slicer to kind of drill down into the specific mode of the music. I would expand my data set back, look for the field that has mode. You could either drag and drop it into this place, right? Or I could drag and drop it down into the visualization bar, into that chat bar. And um, typically I, I do not like working with, you know, this kind of um, drill down. So I would just come here. This is, you know, so this is where you see your visualizations. This is where you see your field. This is where you are able to format your visualizations. We'll come down to formatting. We'll would look at slicer property. It shows you the options. Your slicer could either be a vertical list, which you currently have, a drop down, or a towel. Basically, it depends on what you want. So I guess I think the towel looks fancy. So I'll just pick the towel instead. And um, it's kind of important we make it broad because if I if I'm a user and I come down here, um. With visualizations, you need to put the things you want people to see out there more. So we would make this, you know, mode board so people can actually see that, you know, part of the data set. So we go to we change the title name, make it bold, um, have a consistent font type, probably increase this also. So yeah, those are, you know, some sort of things you could do. And honestly, there's so much more you could do. You could come back to effects give it the shadow thingy we did for this one, for the um, header, for the logo we had here, or you could also leave it that way. So, and now what you will notice is that if I pick on major, it's it streams down, it drills down to only, you know, data sets, major um, streams that have the mode with major or like streams, like number of tracks that like that fall into these specific categories, right? If I unclick it, it's, you know, we shuffle the data set basically. See, this is what we mean by interactive. And yeah, this is me using the data set I have. You could, you know, use a slicer depending on like whatever data set you actually import into this space. So that's that for this one. And the next thing we would achieve is looking at the top five um artists with most songs, right? So to get the top five artists with most songs, I would be using a a what's it called? A Bar chart. Um, oh no, I don't think that's a bar chart, sorry. That's a, yeah, this is a column chart, I believe. 
So we'll be using a column chart. I would import this top five artists with most songs. Like the heading say top five artists with most songs. So we're going to use the artist name definitely. Um, yeah, click on that. The artist name on the X as is, um, the track name, and the Y as is, the count of that instead. So basically, that's how we get this result. And how I was able to make it into top five, because definitely your data set just gives you the whole, right? It gives you the total. So that's why there is a space here called, um, I need to take this away, sorry. There's a, there is a specific um, segment here called filter. It allows you to drill down on another way of also drilling down on specific things. So I want to see just the top five. I don't necessarily you know, care about the rest of the artists. I just want to focus on the top five, guys. I'll come here. Um, This is basic filtering, which means you can filter on specific artists. If you're interested in just Taylor Swift, you can bring up, you know, the visualization to focus on just Taylor Swift. And it gives us that. But we want the top five. So we go to top end. You could, you know, then put 10. What table are we filtering by? We're filtering by the top five, by the, you know, number of tracks they released. Top five, not 10, sorry. Yeah, by the number of track they release. And it gives us that. Um, same thing you do. I think I wouldn't focus on changing the names already since we kind of know how to do that already. I'll just go, you know, to the visualization so we can cover various um, visualization. But same thing here, you come here, bold, make it bold. You can change the text color to what you want, right? Change the name to more, you know, very probably a very insightful way. So top five. Because if you leave it to Power BI, it just what it does is that it links these two together and gives you a name out of it, which is not, you know, which you as a as the person that built it would probably be the only one that understands what's going on there. So that's yeah, top five artists. The next one we would be looking at is the top ten, the top ten songs with most streams. And to look at the top ten strong songs with most streams, we have um track name, right? We'll still be using this visualization. So I'll probably just copy and paste, make the necessary changes. So this, we are looking at top 10 songs. So I don't need the artist name this time around. I need the actual track name. And top 10 songs with most streams. So we would be counting streams in this situation. And, you know, good for us. Our data set has the stream already. Drag and drop the stream column. It shows you the, you know, songs with most streams. I can take out the filter that was filtering on artist name because this data set does not involve artist name this time around. Take it out, um, sum of streams and... We can drill down to top 10 again by, you know, selecting top 10, writing 10, and dragging streams up here because we are looking at most streams. Apply this, and it gives you the top 10 songs with most streams. Change the title where necessary. Top 10 songs. And yeah, that's how we achieve that. Um, we would be going into line visualization next, and um, we would look at this, right, but we won't be plotting it because this is a unique kind of graph where we had to do some sort of calculation using something called DAX queries in Power BI. So it's, um, it's a data analysis expression, like a formula that allows you, because sometimes you have your data set, right? But to be fair, it's advisable to start, you start with this first and, you know, probably go along the way. Sometimes you have your data set and some information you need are not something you can basically like basically get from dragging and dropping. It may require some sort of calculation, some sort of summing, average, or some sort of calculation. And Power BI allows us to do that calculation in Power BI. So I would leave this for now and come back to it when we are, you know, done reviewing like the other visualizations. So we'll go to line graph next. And for line graph, we want to look at. Like I said earlier, we have songs that are released, like, you know, we have artists that do this, and I'm testing my hypothesis here, like where people release song at a specific time of the day, um, at a specific um, day of the month. So we want to see how true this is by, you know, plotting the distribution of song by the day they are being released, right? And to do this, we would be using the release day, which is available in our data set already. So I will just import a line graph here in the data set, 
um, there is a column called release day. I'll drag the release day here. It shows it by each day. I will still drag the release day again, but this time around, I will be looking at the song to show us like the number of songs that were actually released in that specific day. So this drills down from first to like the last day of the month. So there is nothing in 35, obviously. So um, you could, you know, take out 35 and all of that. But this is what, you know, it shows us, you know, the songs that were released in each number of the month. Sorry, that will be count, not, not um, song. Because it shows you like, you know, it's going to be count because um, the data set is showing you. So like these are very, these are things that are also very important. You need to know when to use count and when to use sum, right? You use sum when it's like um, an increasing value, if that makes sense. So if we're looking at streams now, we could say we are using sum because streams shows you the number of times that song was streamed. But like for here, we have to use count because this data set shows like um, a data, a date type, not necessarily, you know, number related, numerical related um, data set. It shows you the date type. So we just want to see, you know, how many songs were released on the first of whatever month, on the first day of the month, on the second day of the month and all of that. So we'll be using count instead. So it shows you the distribution of how songs were released on each day of the month. Um, another thing we also said we would look at is, so basically, um, yep, I just selected the line graph added, you know, the necessary columns. And it's also important to note now that um, depending on the chart, right, various chart requires various information from you. Um, for a line graph now, I could add an extra Y axis here, right? Um, for, a, for a column, yeah, a column chart, you don't necessarily have that opportunity to add an extra Y axis. So you choose your chart type based on the kind of result you are kind of trying to produce. And you know, so far it's but um line graphs are very good for time series analysis. And this result is a you know time series you know result because we are looking at evolution of something over time and it's easier to represent that in a line graph. So for the next one we would look at also using a line graph right this time around but we are looking at let me confirm sorry my memory is not that <laughs> We're looking at the evolution of songs released on Spotify. So yeah, we're trying to see how Spotify has grown over the period of years, how many songs have been dropped on Spotify over the period of years. So um, for years, we have the years here. I have my line chart, click on it, drop the years, drop the years also, noting that we are looking at count. <clears throat> and this is interesting to see, right? Because this data set has, you know, result right from 1913 down to, 2023 and you can see how you know you see how you know the growth has you know how obvious the growth is and yeah why i say it's important to you know now i'll change this chart to let's change it to a column chart um you might see it this way right but it's not as smooth as the way you would see it when you use a line chart so um line charts are really great for time series analysis but i wouldn't say this is necessarily a good visualization result because it's it's not necessarily showing you the in-depth changes. It's just, you know, it gives a summary of the months, right? And it's not really showing you like an in-depth you know, changes. So um, one thing I apply, you know, in whatever visualization I'm doing is I want it to be easy to understand, very simplify that, you know, a, you know, a very non-technical person could come into my dashboard and understand, okay, this is what this person is trying to achieve with this. So um, we're looking at top 10, back to top 10 again. On 10, um, the filtering by release year count, and we apply that. So we go from 2013 down to 2023. So, yep, that's how we get this one. Um, I wouldn't focus on changing the name again because um, I would want to take questions very soon. Um, yep, next thing, another, another interesting thing we would look at is um, something called a scatter plot. So scatter plots are good to um kind of see correlation between two to see the relationship between two data points. So um it shows you how like they move together, kind of the trend or the similarities between them. And we want to we spoke about looking at the similarities between some of the song features and how it influences streams in this situation. So which is why I'll be using a, a scatter plot to kind of see that relationship. So we'll still use the same selection feature. Um, 
you know, I just minimize it using things like using the actual visualization to minimize it, drag it down. Um, so what do we do next? We go back to visualization. Um, um, like I explained earlier, you see that for the line graph, we have, you know, you class X axis, Y axis, and some other features from up. But from for this one, you could actually put in the size for your scatter plots. You could put in, you know, some you, you could put in a lot of various things. So you you just pick the visualization that fits what you're trying to achieve. So this time around, we are looking at we'll start with danceability, like I mean. The fact that this song is danceable to so does it increase the stream online and all of that. Um, so we'll put our danceability in the X as is. Um, we do not want to see the sum. You need to always check what your data result is giving you. So you ask it not to summarize because this danceability um um column includes um it shows you um percentage type data set. So we do not want to summarize, we just want it to show it in the same percentage. Then we bring um where's the streams? We bring the streams to the x-axis and yep, voila, it shows us the visualization of how, you know, it moves, basically. It shows us that actually it looks like danceability actually increases the stream of music because everyone wants a song they can actually dance to, to be fair. So it kind of increases the stream. And another thing we looked at also is some other sort of tools here too, like I'll just copy and paste, change this from danceability to liveliness. If you know you're still like using the same chat type, you can just easily copy and paste and you know change the exact axis to the new axis you want to work with. Do not summarize. And yes, it shows us that same thing. So, and if we come back here, the interesting thing is that if we come back here and choose the mode, it still applies to every single visualization here. It applies to every single thing. And if you have a visualization where you know that, okay, I actually do not want um I do not want my, what's it called? Let me see if I can figure that out in a minute. I should be able to, let's see. It's been a while I've done this, but if you know you do not want your, um, your, you know, your filter to kind of affect some of the visualization here, there is a way of um actually changing that somewhere in Power BI. Um, and I'm trying to see if I can easily pull that out. Let's see. I wouldn't spend time doing this if it's not something I've I can you know pull out for us immediately, but let's see what we can do. Format, I think it should be format. Edit interaction. Yeah, great. So um, if you know you don't want, you know, any of this to apply, you know, the filter to actually apply to one of these visualizations, you can select this. You come to format, edit interaction. For that visualization, you click none, which means that, you know, that filter should not apply to my visualization results. So now I have clicked none on this. If I come back here and I click on this result, it's not going to affect this visualization result because I do not want it to affect it. So that's what the use of this edit interaction does in this situation when you click it. It doesn't, you make sure, you know, whatever you, you know, whatever you do does not affect, you know, a specific visualization. If that's what your dashboard, you know, you want to achieve with that specific dashboard. So yeah, I'll stop here for this draft. Just give us a brief overview of this. So we, we almost got it, but yeah. We got something similar to be fair. We didn't just plot the energy level, but I wouldn't think it would be an issue because you just need to still copy and paste, change where necessary to energy level. So it's basically still the same thing. Um, so we would look at this one, this last query that um I didn't plot. So what was I trying to look at here? I was trying to look at how um a song appearing appearing on a playlist actually influences its chat appearance, right? Which means, okay, having a song on a playlist numerous times doesn't necessarily mean it tops the chat in whatever situation, right? And to be able to get this, let's remember that this data set we're working with, it has um, data from, you know, Spotify chat, Apple Music chat, Deezer chat, and it also has data from Spotify playlist, Apple Music playlist, and Deezer playlist. And I want to see an overall overview. I don't care about, you know, we don't care about the specific platform this time around. We just want to see if 
playlist appear, influences, you know, the chat appearance. So what do we do to see that kind of thing? You, which means you have to sum all the appearances on the chat and also the appearances on a playlist. So that's where we introduced something called a DAX query. Sorry, guys, excuse me. Um, so the data set, which includes in Apple playlist, in data playlist, and in Spotify playlist, we want that all added together. So I created a new column, right, called total appearance in chat. So what does that do? It sums all the appearance from like whatever platform we have. So what this is how a DAX query works. It just gives you, so how do I create a new DAX query? I won't necessarily create one. So you create a new query by, you know, you will need to understand, am I trying to create a new column for my database or a new measure? And how do you know if you want to create a new measure or column? If you're trying to look at something related to sum, you probably want to create a new measure. Um, if you're trying to look at something that like goes down to every single data set, then you want to like probably create a new column, right? I don't know if, I hope that makes sense. If you're looking at things like um, average mathematical calculations, actually, maybe it's worth using measures instead. But, you know, column is something that is more, let's say you are trying to tell the data set, if this is equal to this, assign one. If this is equal to this, assign two. That's, you know, this would create a column. So we would come to new. When I come to new, it loads this for you. You paste this there. I hope I was able to copy that actually. Yes, yes, you paste this. Um, You give it a new name, sum. Um, I'm trying to look at the sum of all, like across all chat types. Sum, you give it, you know, table name, the column in that table, plus whatever you are trying to sum next, still similar, you know, table name, column name, plus sum, table name, which is Spotify 2023, column name, which is in these chat. That's how we were able to get this. And when you click add, it commits it. I mean, it won't be able to add that because we already created that new column. So that's what this does. And... I created that for the total of Apple Music, total of, you know, in chat appearance and also total of in playlist appearance also. And when we did that, what we did next was to, uh, what I did next was to kind of plot that same graph using, you know, the track name and the total appearance in chat, the total appearance in playlist. And we're able to see that actually a song having a very high level of appearance in playlist doesn't necessarily, you know, mean it's topping the chat and all of that. So that's not, you know, it doesn't drive that way. So, I mean, I feel like this result would mean that people are more like, people are probably streaming the song more, which is why it's appearing on the charts than actually adding it to their playlist. So yeah, that's, you know, that's just, you know, something on, yeah, I think I'm done now. This is it on the dashboard. Back to, I'll just, you know, we have just one more slide on this and it's a wrap. Um, so yeah, the key takeaway is that, you know, this is very accessible for everyone. As you can see, we didn't necessarily have to use any no code tool, but deep down the line, you could, you know, you know, try DAX queries along the way, but you don't necessarily have to use it. We we're able to build out this dashboard in like 30 minutes. You know, we were able to put a lot of visualization in 30 minutes. So the speed is actually really great. Um, integration tools, you know, to import data sources. We were able to import a CSV data source and I showed us the various, you know, we had up to like 10 various ways of importing data shown there. Um, also, yeah, industry adoption. A lot of, you know, industries are, I feel like 90% of organizations actually use no code visualization tools now. You hardly find any organization that doesn't use any. So um, cloud-based sharing, I could easily share that dashboard. I could publish that dashboard also. So some tips is to like make sure, sorry about that guys. You start with templates, which is important. It kind of guides your visualization. But maybe along the line, when you get really advanced with Power BI, you don't necessarily need to start with templates. You can just build your thing. But you know, for starters, it's important. It's, it's interesting starting with templates because you kind of see what is achievable from looking at those templates. You see that you know, because just learning by starting by yourself would not you would not be able to explore some things. But looking at you know, various templates and see what, seeing what people have built out like, oh, this is probably, this is actually very possible. You see the possibilities of Power BI by using templates, using query editors also to transform the data set and leveraging DAX queries, which is what we, you know, looked at basically. So thank you guys for yep, your time. We'll take some questions and yeah, I'll hand over back to Lazy. Wow, thank you. That was awesome content.
We do have one question here in the Q&A. Uh, were you demoing on the free tier of Power BI? Is that what folks should expect to see when they log in for a free tier? Um, I wasn't demoing on the free tier, right? But if you use the free tier, you would still see all of this. Um, I'm not very sure. I think the free tier offers the same thing for like a specific period of months or specific period of week. So it doesn't kind of, it doesn't necessarily limit, you know, the features. It just offers it for like some months or some weeks, I guess. Great. Awesome. Yeah, we have one. How would you suggest taking this dashboard to the next level of complexity? And what topics would you explore for this data set? Um, to the next level of complexity, maybe what um using DAX queries actually, you know, you know, the correlation analysis we looked at down there. Um, typically it's not advisable to have like three different, you know, correlation analyses, you know. To the next level of complexity would mean actually plotting all that, you know, putting all that feature into one and kind of analyzing the correlation between all features and streams instead of like separate features. And what would that mean? It would mean we'd have to introduce working with DAX queries to kind of, you know, more like sum those different features and assign some sort of percentage to them and plotting that against the stream basically. So maybe probably using an heat map, like a heat map instead of, you know, scatter plot and all of that there's so much more you could explore and from also using the data set you would also like see more questions you could also answer from that there are so many things we did not touch in that specific data set also that yeah but one would be you know the correlation analysis basically and that's one i can think of from the top of my head and i'm very sure i was able to think of others when i was working with it but that's one for sure for now that's super helpful just to kind of see the uh, thought process where you were yeah. jumping into work Go. But yeah, I think there's a lot of other data in that data set. Exactly. Uh, do you have any other recommendations on how to get better at Power BI? Yeah, um, you know, just there are a lot of courses on LinkedIn on using Power for using Power BI. And the good thing is that Power BI is a is um it's owned by a particular pl platform, it's owned by Microsoft. So they have various courses, you know, that focuses on learning how to use Power BI. If you check online, there should be some um data analyst pathway with microsoft that would include actually working with power bi all through and you know using various linkedin courses also would be helpful excellent call ups another one here how do you deliver dashboards to the employer when you're done so you deliver it by publishing that dashboard so if we go back to that screen i'll share it for a bit and show you how we can publish a dashboard so this is the dashboard, right? You could basically, I'm not going to publish it, but <laughs> you could, yeah, you know, you could share it to your employee. They see your dashboard and you could also come back to home. You could publish this dashboard. What publishing means is that you are making it go live on, you know, your Power BI webs um, online account. And when you do that, you could, you know, share it to your employer, share it to your whole team, basically give them some, some, some sort of viewer rights, right? That way your dashboard is not just published for the whole world to see or your, your organization's information is not just out there. So yeah, save changes. If I say share, yeah, if I copy this link, I can easily share it to my employee, manage access of wherever I share it to. So those are like various ways. And there's also a feature on Power BI that allows you yeah, I'm not going to do this, but this is what you can do. And so there's also a feature on Power BI that allows you um create an app, right? So you could have scenarios where you are tracking various things in your organization. Let's say you have a product performance dashboard, you have a employee related dashboard right you could create an app in power bi it's called an app where you could actually deploy like three four um, reports together in that same place and share it using one link which means your employer can you know go through each of those dashboards in one particular space so you might be worth just looking at what apps in power bi is also for like what it's about to another question here how do you stay up to date on industry trends do you have any recommendations there? Um, um, I read a lot. So I, you know, I follow some interesting pages on Medium page. And to be fair, another way I stay up to trend is I also, you know, 
you know, being in a community like women who code. So um, I, you know, put my space myself in a space where I get to, you know, interact or like, you know, communicate with people in similar spaces in the data science space. I subscribe to um, papers that I'm interested in, you know, the specific area of data science I'm interested in on Medium. So I have a couple of channels I'm subscribed to on Medium. I follow um, industry experts in the space on LinkedIn and the likes. So for research papers, I read sometimes, but I wouldn't say that's my active way of doing it. I just, you know, read short medium posts and follow industry experts and all of that. And if I have specific things I'm trying to research on, then I go as deep I, I could go down to research papers. So I would recommend you, you know, join communities that are actually focused on things like, I guess it's data science that, you know, you want to do, focused on industry spaces you actually want to stay up to date in and Subscribe to pages that you know actually publish information about that. Follow industry experts on like LinkedIn and various spaces also. One more question for you in your role as a data scientist, uh, where do you really struggled um, and how much of your role is really delivering dashboards and presenting data? Um, I would say where I struggle is as a data scientist, you have to, a lot of it is not just about actually working with the data. You have to understand what the business does. You really have to understand because you you can only, you know, produce insightful information when you actually understand what the business does. So it's sometimes at the beginning, it's probably going to, at the beginning, not necessarily, it's a struggle to actually get the domain understanding of what the business does, right? So I would say that's one struggle. You have to, you know, it's very what I've learned for the past few years is not just like it's not just about the data to now. It's about understanding what the business wants to see, how the business makes money, how the business goes about things. So I think I would say I used to struggle with that. I wouldn't necessarily say I struggle with actually presenting the dashboard. It's just, you know, understanding what the business does. And sometimes, right? Also understanding what the stakeholder wants. Because sometimes they would ex they will tell you what they want, but when you listen to them speak, you know that this is not what this person actually wants. They want, you know some other sort of information. So you need a very high, like, you need to, like, you know, I think I've, I'm a bit, I mean, I'm still a work in progress in that situation, but I've learned to actually um ask them the right questions. So I, I really get what they are trying to say, not what they are necessarily telling me. So you need to know how to communicate well. So yeah, that's one thing I used to struggle with. And one thing I still struggle with, and I probably will if I change, you know, the industry I work in is actually, starting from afresh to really learn about, you know, that domain or whatever industry I move to and how, you know, their business model works. Very, very good advice. I'm hearing that. <laughs> All right, I wanna thank everyone. Otolo, thank you for the great content. We are right up against time. So we are going to wrap here. Um, thanks for all of the participation and I hope everyone has a great day. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Lizzie. Bye. <laughs>